Hello and welcome everyone to this KI Camp webinar about AI in the public interest. How can AI best serve the public interest and how can we build it? These are the main questions that the research group of Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society will talk about today during the next hour. They will give us insights about how they plan to use automatic image recognition, natural language processing and design in creating public interest AI. Before I hand over to Teresa Züga, Hadi Asgari, Freya Hevet, Judith Fassbender and Jakob Stolberg, I would like to explain a little bit about the procedure and give some technical insights. My name is Paula Böhme, I'm a policy fellow at the German Informatics Society and I'm part of the KI Camp team and I will be the host for today's webinar with great support of my colleague Julia Meisner, who's in the background and helping me with the, some technical things. Yeah, that brings me uh, to my next point. You have the opportunity to use the question tool or in German the Fragen tool to ask your questions during the whole webinar. We will collect them and answer them in the end. As this is an English webinar, please ask your questions directly in English if possible. Otherwise, uh, German is fine too and then we will translate them. Yeah, and now I would like to hand over to Teresa Züga, who is the head of the Public Interest AI Research Group. Teresa, the virtual stage is yours now. Thank you, Paula. We are really excited to be here uh, today. And yeah, um, I'm very happy to introduce this research group to you. Um, and we are ad addressing, as Paula said, the question of how to build uh, AI in the public interest and what that actually is. Um, so we are a research group of five people at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. And this is giving you a short overview about who is part of the research group. That's me. I have a um, background in media studies and philosophy and I'm working with Hadi Ashgari. He's the postdoc in the group. Um, he has a background in computer science and public policy. And we are addressing the general overall question, how can public interest AI be defined? and which factors increase or reduce AI's contribution to the public interest. But we don't only want to address this on a theoretical level and develop a model uh, for criteria. We also want to uh, yeah, produce prototypes and those are produced by three of our PhDs, uh, mainly two prototypes and a design concept. And uh, the first of these prototypes uh, is um, made by Jak Jakob stolberg Lassen. He's a math and computer science uh, master, and he will talk about his project a little later. He's working with vision. The second PhD uh, is Freya Hewitt. She will um, talk about her project regarding to natural language processing. And last but not least, um, Judith Fassbender. She's creating a framework from a design perspective for public interest AI and she will also introduce her project. Yes, um, so first of all, I think it's important to clarify what we are talking about and what we understand public interest AI to be. And first of all, uh, we then need to define what artificial intelligence is, because there are so many definitions out there that I think it's necessary to say what we understand it to be. So um, we mean, technologies that are adaptable, interactive and autonomous in um, some way at least, uh, or to a certain degree. And for us, it's very important that AI is a socio-technical system. So it's not only technology, but also human factors involved. It's a technical artifact, so the technical infrastructure, along with technical norms and the artificial agents on one side. But on the other side, there's also human agents involved and also human institutions. By that, norms of actions are, are meant. And uh, for us, the artificial and artificial intelligence mainly means that it's made by humans and hence also the responsibility for uh, AI also stays with the humans. And uh, you might wonder how our concept is related to other discourses that you might have heard of. So for instance, AI for social good or the discourse around AI ethics. And uh, yeah, that is a really important discussion going on. Um, there is a lot of AI guidelines out there that people came up with and researchers uh, tried to 
um, bring them together and see what the consensus is about what values are important for this AI ethics approach. And Floridian Cowles proposed, for instance, that it's five, mainly five values, and uh, they're beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, justice, and explicability. And beneath that, a lot of other values are subsumed. So if you want to look at that concept, that is really a quite comprehensive um, understanding of AI ethics. Um, and we believe that is a very important approach and we kind of build on that. But also we think there is some problems with this uh, approach because it is mainly addressing developers to be the ones making the morally right decisions uh, in the AI um, yeah, context. Um, but there is no consensus that is really a, a strong negotiated consensus about universal ethics. So it's still up for negotiation and still uh, developers need to interpret what it means to build autonomy into an AI. Uh, and so also this whole discussion turns out to be kind of an evasion of regulation. So people believe that AI ethics might be a soft law for them to uh, evade hard laws that will tell them what is allowed and what is not allowed to produce with AI. And also there is another approach called FAT machine learning. So FAT is short for fairness, accountability, and transparency. We believe it's a very important uh, approach that is uh, to, to safeguard against biases in machine learning. We see it as a part of the AI ethics approach um, um, and on a more general uh, basis. And yeah, we believe it's very important, but it is also too narrow for us because we also think that some other values are really important when we come to public interest and we will explain that along the line uh, of our argument today. Okay, so now let's take a closer look at what the public interest is and why this term is important for us and why it makes a difference. Um, it is a term that has been around really long, so you can go back to ancient philosophy and people were talking about the public interest. Generally, the public interest is the goal of morally good actions in a community, so it's the goal of politics. But it is never a universal thing. Like you cannot not say that one thing is always in the public interest. It is always contextual, so it needs to uh, be negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis. It is an ideal that only emerges on that case-by-case -case basis. And it is defined by citizens uh, who want to defend and defend define the public interest. So it's not private actors and their private interests um, making what the public interest is, but people in their role as citizens and as part of a public. So it is inherently a very political idea. And for many philosophers, for instance, for John Dewey, the process was key to find public interest. So it was about how to, to get to this deliberation and participation to have public discussion going on uh, about what the public interest is. And he understood that as a process of social learning and democratic experimentation. And that meant for him that there's also always a room for conflict. So there might be disagreements about what the public interest is in a specific case. And there might be even misunderstandings about that. But one can argue that even the process of that conflict itself encourages the preservation of the public interest because it keeps that discussion alive and that process of negotiation of the people themselves. So now I hand the word to Hadi Ashgari, who will now shed a light on the legal perspective uh, of public interest. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa. Um, so good uh, morning, everybody. Um, just I'll immediately pick up um, and uh, the first thing I would like to say is that the concept of public interest, it has appeared very frequently in uh, both legislation and court decisions in all countries around the world. And um, just as one example, um, if you look at the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, it's something which uh, most of you are familiar with. The, word the phrase public interest appears 70 times in this regulation, um, but it is actually never defined. Uh, and that is a broader actually pattern or theme that although this um, term or this concept has been frequently used in um, the law, it is actually never been very clearly or precisely defined. 
And legal scholars believe that this actually almost paradoxically makes the concept uh, stronger because it makes it very flexible and very robust. Um, nonetheless, there have been kind of attempts uh, to define it in the simplest form. Uh, public interest is usually contrasted versus individual or group interest, and it usually concerns non-market, non-profit uh, goals. Could we? Um, yes. And um, there, there have also been scholars who've kind of tried to um, kind of, let, let's say, dig a little bit deeper into the concept. One of these is uh, Mike Feintuck, and um, he's kind of looked at several centuries of the use of the concept, and he summarizes it that uh, in all the discussions, whenever public interest is used, it is very closely related to equality of citizenship. So. Uh, we think this is very important. It means that if you say something is for the public interest, it has to increase equality as a whole for the public, right? So that, that's kind of like an important and from also kind of uh, these, the, he, he kind of also touches upon the point that Theresa made that the concept is deliberative. Adi, we can't hear you anymore. So, I'm, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you again. Okay, what was the last thing I said? <laughs> I think you need to start over by the concept is also deliberative and has participatory ah, okay. qualities. Okay, yes, I apologize everybody. Um, I, so the, yes, the, the 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 concept is deliberative and participatory, um, and the concept is also um, an, another scholar has kind of who's looked at it says that the concept is very closely tied to the rule of law. Um, why? Because the law is actually a place where people are equal in front of it, irrespective of their power or their wealth. Um, can we go to the last slide? Next slide, please. Yes. So if you take these, like there is actually kind of an overlap between the legal look at it and the political look at it. And it's kind of comes down to these, um, I think, five things, right? It's like public, it's it relates to equality, democratic deliberation and rule of law. And these um, are very general. They're not related to AI. If we kind of try to apply these to the realm of AI, we will see that there is an overlap between them and AI ethics. And we think this overlap is where public interest AI lies. And the interesting part about it is that certain new values are then highlighted if you kind of take this approach. And we think these are key values for public interest AI. So what are they? First of all, if you say it's public, then we think it has to be open source, open science, you know, open data. Um, going back to the issue of equality, um, of course, fairness and justice is related to that, but also access, like and accessibility. Does do do, and this is kind of often we think a little bit overlooked. And one of the things that should be kind of stressed in public interest projects, it should be accessible for everyone. Um, we say it has to be democratically designed, so there, that requires some kind of process of co-design. And also importantly, it has to be open to validation and um, concepts such as accountability and transparency also fall under that uh, open to validation. Um, from the rule of law, um, I think in this concept, in, in this context, uh, uh, the most important part is kind of there has to be legal or lawful data processing, data collection and privacy. And finally, um, if we take since there will be an overlap between public interest and AI ethics, if we take non-maleficence, then another really important factor we think is that public interest AI should not harm the planet um, and it should be sustainable. So the computational infrastructure that's kind of used for it and the kind of algorithms that are looked, this should be one of the things that people think about is how sustainable it is. Um, so this kind of is the is how we conceptualize it. And now I hand the floor over to my colleague um, Freya, who will kind of then take this a little bit more into practice. Yeah, 
Uh, thank you very much. So um, as Teresa said, there are three PhD students in our research group. And in my project, we're looking at um, natural language processing in the context of public interest AI. And specifically, we want to look at developing a tool that can um, automatically simplify German text in some way or another. And so on this slide, I've put three examples of where you might have already encountered simplified text. So on the left, we've got Giolina, that's a uh, magazine designed for kids. Um, on the right hand side, we've got this blue logo with the book. That's the official logo for Leichte Sprache. Um, and Leichte Sprache is designed for uh, people with cognitive disabilities. And then at the bottom, we can see um, Nachrichten Leicht. These are newspaper articles um, from Deutschlandfunk and they're written in Einfache Sprache. So, um, that's a version that sort of comes between standard language and Leichte Sprache, it's sort of in between. So it could be aimed at um, people who aren't native speakers or people who um, have reading skills that aren't as developed. And on the next slide, I've put an example from a well-known data set used for English text simplification. And these are newspaper articles written for children. So they're rewritten at different levels according to what year the children are in at school. Um, and if we go to the next slide, so I'll just read out the example at the top is the is the version in standard language and the uh, version at the bottom is the simplified version. And in blue, I've highlighted the things that have been changed or simplified or deleted. So I'll just read it out. Miguel Castaneda started Tech Connect in 2009 inspired by a similar program in San Francisco. Castaneda, who grew up in Delano, California, thought students in rural communities should have access to the same opportunities as those in more affluent areas. And so this is simplified to, Miguel Castaneda started Tech Connect in 2009. Castaneda grew up in a poor farming area. He believed students in poor areas should have the same chances as those in richer areas. So the types of simplification that we can see, for example, the um, Second part of the first sentence has been has been uh, removed for the simplified version. We can see some lexical substitution, so things like affluent has changed to has been changed to richer. Um, things like access to the same opportunities has been changed to have the same chances. And overall, we can see that the simplified text is um, a bit shorter, contains less information, and um, the sentences is overall are shorter. And so on the next slide, um, so from this like big field of possible things you can do when simplifying text, um, I want to very briefly talk about what I specifically want to look at first. And I'm going to look at discourse structure. Um, on this side is sort of a tree which meant to, is meant to symbolize discourse structure, um, which basically looks at how coherent a text is and is based on the idea that each part of the text that each segment or each sentence has a role in the text overall. So we can see here the first two segments. Um, the second segment provides motivation for the first segment. And in the simplified version, we saw that this second segment was completely removed. And so my idea is to look at if we can see any patterns between discourse structure and text simplification. And on the next slide. Um, so I've talked about one of the main goals for the project, which is the sort of um, the goal of creating this actual tool. And the second goal of the project is sort of like a meta goal. So to see what happens when creating this tool in terms of how easy it is to, to look at these public interest AI values. So obviously inherently included in the content of the project is this goal of accessibility. By creating this tool that simplifies language, um, we can ensure that more people have access to information. So if everyone could read newspaper articles, then all members of society can access this information. And so um, that's obviously uh, this value of accessibility and equality. But then on this meta level, um, we also want to look at when actually creating this tool, how easy is it to make sure it's open source? How easy is it to make sure that we can have this feedback loop and um having people giving us validation and um now i'll pass over to my colleague jacob who is also going to be focusing on these two goals but in a computer vision context 
Yeah, thank you, Freya. Um, so, as Freya said, um, the point of my project is uh, in terms of goal the same as uh, Freya's, but I'm going to do a project together with a partner, um, Wheelmap. Um, so, Wheelmap is a, a map based on OpenStreetMap and open source uh, world map um, where users can enter information about the accessibility of public spaces, for example, cafes or cinemas, for uh, wheelchair users or people who have the same, um, who face the same barriers as wheelchair users. Um, and so this project is at the moment uh, crowdsourced. So it's basically people who just enter information about um, about the places accessibility um, and um, my project would then be about uh, investigating how you could make some sort of computer vision assisted uh, tool that um, can help automate this process uh, or make it possible to extend the range of places that can be uh, assessed um, in this uh, wheel map. Um, at the moment, the specifics of the project is still a bit unclear because um, what we need is first and foremost to um, make sure that the, the project is actually uh, useful for uh, people who are facing these barriers um, and it has an actual impact on these users. Um, secondly, there's also a limitation in what is feasible. We don't have a big team to, to develop this tool, so um, what can actually be done? And then lastly, there's also a question of um, what data can we find and use for the project? And also, um, would there be ways of collecting data that would be relevant to, to carry out this project? So all of these specifics um, are something that we need to discuss then with Wheelmap, as they are the ones who have the best idea of what would be useful to their user base and which places are the most problematic at the moment as it is. Okay, but um, either way, there's still some technical aspects that I find interesting and relevant for this project. And um, um, one particular interesting one is that of transfer learning. So in transfer learning and machine learning, is the idea that you have one model that is traced, uh, trained on some um, um, source objective, on some source data, so not the task that you want to perform, um, but still having already trained this model, you can use some of the information that this model has learned when you want to train another model for another task. Um, so what is illustrated here, for example, is um, what is called pre-training and fine-tuning. There's also other methods such as uh, knowledge transfer. Um, but either way, the idea is that using this transfer of already learned information, you can reduce the requirements on how much data you need to train uh, your model for your new task. And you can also reduce um, the amount of computational resources that you need uh, to train the model compared to if you had to train it completely from scratch. So this is both interesting for this particular project because uh, of our limits on resources and on possibly on data we have to uh, solve this task. But it's actually also quite interesting in general for from a public uh, interest AI perspective. Um, for example, the possibility of other um, public interest AI projects may often be limited by the amounts of data or computational resources by the organizations or people that want to make it. So um, developing transfer learning methods could enable more people to train public interest AI models. Um, but it's also interesting from, for example, a, a sustainabil sustainability perspective in that it can reduce the computational resources, so thereby the footprint on our planet um, when training these models. So in that sense, it's also interesting more generally. Um, that was all I 
had to say. Um, next, Judith will tell a bit about uh, her project on um, on the design perspectives of um, making public interest AI projects. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jacob, and hello from my side. Um, so the main objective of my PhD project is to develop a framework to integrate public interest AI values on a design level of AI-infused systems. And I will walk you through my project along the three major building blocks. The first one um, raises the question how the user is seen within human-computer interaction. The second one is about the interplay between values and design. And I'm going to be closing with the implementation process of uh, public interest AI values in such systems. Continuing, yeah. Um, so first, the um, view of the of the user. So conventionally, the conception of the user is that of a customer and of a psychological entity. But very often, the view of the user is limited to the use of the system. But if we look at it more holistically. We can actually also see that the same user is a political entity, so to say, uh, a citizen. And with that come certain characteristics. So a citizen user has rights and obligations. A citizen user is a lay person with non-expert knowledge. And further, the citizen user is the smallest unit of society. So how one user interacts with the system has impacts on how society at large uh, is in relation to a certain technology. So what I'm basically doing is that I'm constructing that citizen user as kind of a lens to change perspective. And what that actually means is that we can move on from only consumer protection to citizen user participation within the design of these systems. And um, as an example, explainability would then not only be a means for trust in itself and a product, but actually a prerequisite to um, participate in the process of designing these um, these systems and also as a basis for informed decisions. Continuing on the next slide. Um, so I basically built on the stand of value sensitive design that values can and should be incorporated in um, such systems from the beginning and that this should actually go through the whole process. Um, so what that actually means, I came up with a scenario on the basis how the project Jacob is doing with wheel maps um, could evolve and what kind of public interest AI features could be implemented in there. So let's imagine wheel maps integrates the automated image recognition program to enhance accessibility. Um, what they can do then is to integrate a feature that allows users to give feedback if the automated prediction was actually correct, if a surrounding is barrier-free and usable on wheels. Um, and in the next step, then developers could take that feedback into account and um, iterate the system accordingly. So we have a little moment of collective evaluation already here. And what we can do further is that in the setup of the whole project, this could happen in dialogue with target users already. Um, and beside that, a moment of transparency would be necessary. So um, that is transparent for a user how a prediction came to be, what model was used, what data was used, how the results were evaluated by other users, and also, also how the system was um, altered accordingly. Um, another level, it's important to have the, uh, the model openly accessible, as Jacob explained already, in terms of sustainability. Um, continuing with the implementation, um, as some of you maybe have thought of already, it's quite a, a, um, a process with some challenges. So we have on one hand the interplay between values. So if we open, um, open up that wide and have models accessible, we might come across problems of dual use. What has to be thought of from the beginning, then um, the public interest AI features are always parallel to the primary task so you have have to take that into account and balance it and in general it's a rather resourceful um, and resource intensive process so therefore it's really important to have a framework that actually allows organizations to implement that and to do that in the most in a yeah to do that in a feasible way and what i can share up to now with you according to these um these frameworks and what kind of questions there are and what kind of requirements is that we need context sensitivity as these primary tasks a assisting um, program faces differ a lot and therefore also the, the moment in which they're used differs so that context has to be uh, taken in consideration and there's a question of medium 
So up to now, most of most frameworks to guide anything are really based on text, but uh, there are opportunities to work with visualizations with uh, methods like uh, scenario building or um, alike. And uh, yeah, closing, what you probably also noticed already, that is a really interdisciplinary um, endeavor we're facing here. And that's also true for, uh, for the organization. So you have different teams with different backgrounds and different stakeholders, which have to uh, be uh, integrated in that process. So you have to cater to very different backgrounds of knowledge and also of, of needs. Um, so that framework should really address not only the developer, but uh, enable kind of a collective action to realize public interest AI values um, within these systems. And continue. Yeah, we would really like to thank you for your uh, attention up to now. We're really interested in your thoughts and your questions about what you heard so far. And I would hand over to Teresa. Yes, so uh, thank you very much. Um, I noted down all our email ad addresses uh, because now we have about 15 minutes to answer questions, but I wanted to give you the chance if you have any further questions or want to get in contact with us about our research, then feel free to just send us an email. And now I will uh, stop sharing uh, the screen and actually start looking at the questions that people uh, send us here. Give me one second to switch there. Uh, okay, so we didn't get direct questions from you, but we could maybe uh, just raise some of the questions that maybe come, came up for you and discuss those a little bit further. But if uh, in the process, while we're speaking, uh, some questions arise for you, or if something wasn't totally understandable, please feel free to just put that in the question box uh, in your menu, and we will pick up your questions along the way. So, um, one thing... Um, yeah, we could maybe address is the question uh, about how these values uh, should, yeah, how they differ in importance. So uh, we uh, explained that uh, we believe um, that accessibility is a very important value, that openness is a very important value for public interest. But um, the, um, it might be an interesting question, like what is the most important part? So uh, maybe we start talking about that. And I would give the word to Freya to maybe give her opinion on that and we take it from there. Yeah, um, thank you. So I think my answer to this question might be influenced by my background from like a more technical background. Um, so first of all, I'd say you can't really rank them. But if you force me to, then um, I would say that for me, like open source is important because in my opinion, if something is open source, then all the other values can be realized by, by other people. So if, um, if something's open source and another, use, another stakeholder wants to make it accessible, then they can do that. They have the ability to do that. Um, and yeah and that can also things like uh, making making a system open to validation i think that's also possible if something's open source because basically you're you're putting your software in the hands of the public and so they can do that and i'd also say that sustainability is obviously a, a value that should be at the forefront of any kind of decision or any kind of um, project um in this day and age because it's um yeah it's a climate emergency <laughs> So yeah, but yeah, open source definitely at the top. So we have one question here that I think is very interesting. It's about if the concept that we developed is an inherently European concept. And uh, Tali and I actually had a conversation about that before. And uh, so maybe I'll give the word to you, Hadi, to give your opinion first, but I can also add something to that question. Hadi, we can't hear you again. Uh, I think you need to restart your mic. Like we had trouble with that before, sorry, but he will be there in a second. Please say something. Okay. Yeah, yes. now, now we hear it. Yes, 
Um, so I think, um, I, I personally don't think that the concept um, is uh, necessarily European. I think, it, I think the way we have kind of studied it, of course, um, kind of European law and also American law, which is itself based on European law. Um, and uh, the, the concept is very closely related to civic republicanism, which goes back, um, I think, all the way to the time of the Greeks and the Romans. Um, so that is the kind of particular approach we've looked at it. But if you, but also there is the UN Declaration of Rights, and a lot of the things that uh, we kind of look at in public interest are. Nope, oh, you're gone again. <laughs> How do you encounter you? So now, a lot of those values are basically universal values. So that's kind of like the, the 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 short version of it. There might be like specific takes that are kind of more European, but I think the the, the values as a whole are what I would definitely say human values. So they're like universal. That's my take on it. Yeah, I would add one thing, and that is that. Um, I think the important distinction is that the concept that we designed is definitely a very democratic concept. So for us, uh, the belief that democracy is not only voting, but also very active participation and even participation in creating technologies that are shared by a lo lots of citizens uh, is a very important thought. And any regime that would not support these democratic values definitely will have nothing to do with what we understand public interest AI to be. So I think that this is an important distinction here. And uh, we actually got one really interesting question. Um, from uh, Tamara, um, that is about the um, project that uh, Jakob was introducing, uh, the computer vision um, project, because she says that she definitely understands that um, this AI uh, to map uh, accessibility for wheelchair users is in the public interest, but how about the dual use that actually, actually the same technology could be used for uh, the accessibility of autonomous weapons? Um, and yeah, so it's addressing this dual use character of AI um, technologies. And I uh, think that is a very valid and very important question. And I would first ask uh, Jakob to think about that and to, to answer to that uh, if he has a uh, direct response. Um, I don't know if I have a direct response. I haven't. Um... Uh, particularly yet thought about the option to use uh, this information for automated weapons. Um, I think yeah I mean I'm not sure like if if this kind of accessibility will be of great use to automated weapons. Um, I imagine you know the development of automated weapon system is mostly at the moment focused on drones, for example, is my impression. And for drones, for example, the accessibility on wheels is not uh, a big question. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I'm also uh, curious, like, about which places you think of this. The one thing that is quite nice about the the wheel map initiative is that it's based on open street map, so it actually covers the whole world, at least places where the uh, open street map is getting mapped. Um, so there's of course a question if that could lead to some dual use in some places. Um, I don't uh, particularly see automated weapon in the streets of uh, European cities at the moment. But of course, there could also be other places in the world where that would be an issue. So, I think it's definitely uh, worth checking that out and having it in mind that we can maybe do our best to make dual use as impossible as we can. But on the other hand, I believe that maybe the military uh, production of AI is far ahead in that regard uh, in comparison to civil projects like we are. So probably we're not developing something that they don't already have. 
Uh, but definitely, I think it's something we need to be very aware of, that we don't create something that could be used in different contexts. Uh, we got a very interesting question from Charlotte, and she's asking something that I would direct to Judith. Uh, because she's asking, users aren't just citizens, of course. They occupy all, uh, occupy all kinds of social roles, they're employees or parents. What do you find particularly interesting about the focus on citizens? Maybe you can answer that first, Judith. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think what is particularly interesting is the moment of, or there, there are certain, there are different points which are really interesting. One point I think is really interesting that if you, um, address somebody as a citizen, you go back to rule of law and you also go back to that equality moment that basically everybody is the same, which in on an argumentative level, argu argumentative level goes back to, uh, to the values we're using and to uh, idea of democracy. And um, further, whilst an employee can also always be an expert on technology, a citizen who is as all citizens, um, I can basically start from a level of really low knowledge and really make it accessible for most most people. So therefore, I really go for that perspective. But it's really true that there are different roles to consider as well. Yeah, that would be my thought about that. We got another really interesting question regarding uh, public interest AI solutions. The question is like, how can uh, open source projects uh, in this realm of public interest AI be protected from exploitation through non-public interest actors, so maybe commercial actors. Uh, yeah, and she asks, or he, sh he asks, uh, if we consider this situation or at all, or if we just ignore that risk. And I think it's a very interesting and definitely necessary question. And my direct response would be um, that definitely we uh, should consider that risk. And I think that today, at least, there is some, um, cr yeah, like uh, common. Um, Creative Commons and other standards that we can use to make sure that whatever we produce is, uh, is can only be used in an open source uh, and non-for-profit context. We also try to only use that kind of data and actually also uh, convince people to open up data that is necessary for our projects to also be open for other researchers. Um, and so I think that uh, definitely this is important and definitely it should be a consideration that it cannot be used for other purposes in the future. And yeah, I think definitely a very important point. Does anyone uh, want to add on that in the team or uh, did I answer okay? You did answer very okay. <laughs> but I would, um, I would uh, maybe add that in the best case, uh, it kind of spreads a seed where moments as accessibility and co-design are adapted as well. So I think it's really, really a, a, a very sensitive or a really uh, fragile balance when you say, when you talk of exploitation and when you actually see that the values we are working for are taken over in a commercial sector as well. So um, I, I think, yeah, what, what, just adding to what uh, Teresa said that there is also maybe a slight positive side to that. And now uh, I think we can actually go to uh, the last question because we're almost running out of time. Um, um, so I think I had one question that I looked at that I actually find interesting, even though it's hard to answer. And that is, what would you recommend policymakers looking for uh, ways to pilot AI in local authorities? Do you have a software or a tool you would recommend to start with? A good example for a public administration implementing or experimenting with AI in the public interest? I think that is a very uh, good question because I don't know of many projects in that realm yet, to be honest. Uh, I think there is some experimentation with AI, definitely, but I don't think that this whole idea that all these criteria that we are talking about are already met in the public administration, that is really new. Uh, so I will, I think, hand the question openly to the group. Does anyone want to start answering? 
I would maybe yep. I think there is there that there is not one way to go for it, but um, that there are many research groups uh, working in that direction. That probably uh, my suggestion would be to look at uh, institutes and universities and find people of interest for you and contact them because most people are really interested in implementing what they're what they're researching for. So I think that would be my suggestion for now. I totally agree with that and I also think that uh, the worst way to go would just to simply take a tool uh, what the person was asking for and simply try it out and implement it because uh, if you don't have the knowledge about what data the tool is based on what decisions or how it's actually getting to decisions I think it might be even uh, yeah a little bit dangerous for the discussion to to uh, just try something out that you don't have full transparency of. I think we have seen those examples, for instance, in the Netherlands or in other uh, yeah, areas where people were using AI tools that they didn't fully uh, produce or understand. And uh, I think uh, really uh, the research in that direction is starting now. And I would definitely also recommend to collaborate. Okay. Yeah, can uh, I, I, I would also like to add uh, to that that I, I think it's a great question um, and I think everyone's figuring out this space at the moment. The only thing I would add is also to really remember in the deliberation that the purpose should be the public. So it should be a project that maps those kind of principles and, at le and I think because there's also a lot of cases where for instance cities have been asked to join like smart city projects etc and it's not always clear who benefits from those or are they really in the really in the public interest and i think for people in that in public administration i i, I think like really thinking about those principles from the start and throughout the project is going to be really important Fantastic. So uh, thank you very, very much for those great questions that we uh, got in the end. And I would now end the discussion because we're already a little bit over time. But if you want to keep talking or keep exchanging, then please feel free to all send us an email. Sure. And Teresa, I would, apparently we yeah. do have a bit more time. Um, Who said that? Yeah, okay. Teresa, hi, it's Paula here in the back. Oh, okay. <laughs> hi, Paula um, in the back. Yeah, so the meeting is scheduled until 12. So if you like, you can also okay. uh, go on a little bit more with some questions. Okay, so uh, there is actually two more very interesting questions. So somebody asks, um, uh, Gizine asks, regarding the open source requirement, do you have a suggestion how to combine this with the interest of industries who want to protect their IP? Uh, so, for instance, DNNs trained with tremendous costs regarding training time and data acquisition. I think that is a very interesting question. Uh, Hadi, do you have a direct response to that? Maybe I think you are the first. Yeah, yeah, the I, yeah I, what I, I thought was like maybe something like a patent system would work there where there would be like a time period where those those like places could kind of use the full version of it, but then they would have to <clears throat> release it for the public at some point. That would be one idea. Um, does anyone in the group want to add something or? <laughs> I think you... yeah, I mean, maybe you could add. Um, I mean, it's not having something open source doesn't mean that you won't be able to then earn money from, from it. Like there's a lot of already existing open source projects that are still commercial projects. So this idea that it's either open source or commercial is also not entirely true, so, so they don't have to collide either. I would also just add that it links back to this idea of the, the other question with open source, so this idea of having a license which limits the usage of the open source stuff and um, yeah, just having licenses is, is a really easy way to sort of regulate the the way open source things are used. Well, maybe I can just add a very general word uh, because I think definitely public interest AIs, as we understand it, are not in the interests uh, of the industry. So we specifically uh, think that private interests of private companies uh, are not in line with the public interest. Uh, like I think there is constellations where also uh, 
stakeholders of uh, industries as citizens could contribute to a project. But as uh, soon as there are commercial interests in the, the mix, that is a contradiction for us to the public interest model that we are developing. Uh, there is another interesting question that I wanted to raise, and it's from Dimitri asking, to what extent does public interest AI depend on a better understanding by the general public about what AI is, can and cannot do? I think it's a very important question. Uh, I haven't definitely have an answer, but um, maybe somebody else of the group wants to start. No? Okay, I start. You add something. Or Judith, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, just a really plain comment to that. I think it's really important, especially to in, in the moment of co-creation, because uh, if you don't know what is basically possible and what kind of consequences things have, co-creation can only take place on, on to, to in a certain extent. And I think that for the point in time where we are now really has to, for, for the moment of co-creation, for example, really has to be taken into consideration. You have to implement moments where you explain things, but it also limits who you can include in a more effective way or not, which is actually not really the moment of accessibility. So I think it's really connected. I don't have a more more clear answer to that now, but that would be my comment on it. Yeah, I think that generally before any type of political action, like regarding technology, there needs to be a literacy. So I would generally agree that there is a huge problem that people in the general public have a very poor understanding of what AI actually is. And I think they have a very Hollywood infused idea of AI technologies. Um, but I would not say that this is the precondition for creating public interest uh, AIs and for involving citizens. I think that we actually need to work on that and need to have more public interest AI projects to actually foster uh, literacy and to include people and to have projects where they feel they can participate if they're interested and by that also gain knowledge and have this what Dewey calls uh, democratic experimentation also with those technologies and uh, yeah by actually uh, being a part of a project uh, learning about AI and maybe losing also the fear to have an opinion on other projects that exist. So I think this can actually be a very good opportunity for uh, literacy around AI. Uh, so now we got some more questions. It's to Freya. Okay, there are areas where the guy is born and grown and translated with poor area. Uh-huh. How do you include such information in a general way, not only for this particular sentence? Do you think it is a good idea to have such judgments about a person by AI? Ah, okay, so uh, that is really going to the example that you have uh, for the English uh, simplification of the language. So, um, yeah, so it's about uh, sensitivity to the content uh, of something that is simplified. Freya. Yeah. Um, so, so the the question is, um, is it uh, a good idea to have such judgment? So, who decides if something's a poor area? Um, I would just say, in terms of like computational linguistics, that's a very sophisticated simplification. I don't know if the current state of the research would be able to to do a simplification like that. Um, I, my personal opinion, if an AI should make a judgment like that, I think potentially in some cases, so in that case, I think it's kind of Im fairly important to understand the, the, the text, to understand the sentence. And um, I think it's a sort of fine line between making things really understandable and making connections between um, different pieces of content, making them really explicit and also still being sensitive and still being um, um, yeah, politically correct. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a fine line and I'm not sure, um, definitely the current AI we have in this area isn't capable of that. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and yeah, it's a very good question. <laughs> um, definitely something to keep uh, validating, keep checking. Um, I think it's, yeah, sorry, uh, um, you go ahead, Hadi. I think it's just a, it's a good question, and I think it also emphasizes the need to have openness for validation uh, and for people to contest uh, what the AI says. So um, 
what we have like what I've seen already is that AI technologies are can be at least as biased as humans are in making judgments. Um, so it, that's why it's very important to be able to say no, I don't agree with this uh, simplification. And then um, for the designers of the AI project to evaluate like this bias. Uh, we got another interesting question from Jana. She said, I just thought about the diversity of the public and that not everyone is necessarily part of the same public. So there's filter bubbles, there's country differences. How to make sure everyone can participate and benefit from such AI systems? I think that is a very good question. Um, does someone want to start answering that? Um, then go ahead or otherwise I can also start, make a try. No one's, okay, no one wants to start, so I will. Um, so I think, yes, the public is something inherently uh, pluralistic. And so there, the idea that the public gets together, deliberates, and then decides uh, like with the consensus always what the public interest is, I think is um, yeah, an illusion that will never be that easy. Uh, and so first of all, I would say it's not necessary that everybody benefits the same amount from a certain technology. It's really more the point that as a citizen, you need to have in mind the general benefit to the public. So nothing that necessarily benefits you as a citizen individually, but really this, there is this level of abstraction for us as political beings to say that the general public benefits. So for some, for instance, something that um, makes us all more accessible or makes something more accessible and makes people more equal in, a, in their um, possibilities to uh, yeah, read news or something like that, that is uh, adding a benefit for everyone, even though it might not necessarily concern me as a person. So I think that is the difference uh, in this concept that it's not necessarily my benefit always, it's really more the general benefit of citizens. And so by proxy, it might also benefit me as a citizen, but it's really not about personal interests and benefits. So there is this one level, but definitely you are right um, that there is a very pluralistic public that has to define um, the public interest. And uh, that's what I said, I think uh, pretty much in the beginning that this means uh, to negotiate that is related to conflict and we need to figure that out. We need to find compromises. We need to deliberate about that. Um, and uh, this yeah, might not always be easy and straightforward. Uh, so I, I think that it's still worthwhile to have this process. Uh, that is the better uh, alternative to having a very powerful group simply deciding what technology looks like and simply deciding what these infrastructures look like. So uh, I think those are the alternatives that we have, but you are completely right that in some cases, uh, there might be disagreements about what the public interest is. Yeah, so that would be my answer. Is there any additions to that from the group? Hadi, uh, we can't hear you, but... <laughs> Sorry, still no. no. Okay. Um, yeah, you just liked it, okay. So I think now we will have the last question because now we're actually uh, almost one hour in. Uh, so the last question is, uh, what is your opinion in using AI to improve health and well-being? I think that is a very broad issue. Maybe I'll give you all a little bit of time to think about that. Does anyone want to start answering? Um, I would just start by saying, um, like the first things that come to my mind is that health and well-being is like a massive field. So there's things like, I don't know, like yoga apps and meditation apps, but then there's also things like making hospitals and doctors more digital. Um, and yeah, I don't have any problem with using AI for these things. I think, um, like making doctors more digital and um, doctors visits more digital is a good thing. Um, if people have the choice between uh, doing something with with an AI or rather with a person, then I think that's good. I think I'll pass to someone else because 
Yeah. I, yeah. You want to go? Um, to just also a really broad answer. I think human well-being is inherently connected to human connection also. So I think there is a danger of uh, if you use AI in uh, exchange for <laughs> human action in that field, that can be really, really difficult and that you can basically open, open a gap between uh, more affluent patients or people who get the human treatment and uh, if you're not as well off, you get the, the technical treatment and otherwise I think it's also um, a very data sensitive field. Um, I think there are certain, uh, there, there are a lot of um, opportunities to use it in a good way, but very sensitive. That's my take. Yeah, maybe maybe I can add to that because I think actually there is a huge need for public interest AI projects in this field of health because right now most of these projects are very pro proprietary and uh, yeah, driven by pharma industry and by companies and I think there should be much more research how actually those projects are designed to preserve rights of citizens, to explain to citizens what decisions are, uh, and to, to like citizens as patients in this case, what decisions are made with the help of AI. And uh, I think there is a huge gap in that field to create public interest AI in the health sector. Uh, because right now I think there is a lot of AI, but it's not really always in the public interest, uh, rather the opposite in some cases, I think. So uh, from my side, this uh, could be a really good um, finishing point. And I thank you for the great conversation. Actually, I think uh, this worked really well. It was really exciting for us. And I definitely think that we will take some of your very good questions into our research. We're just starting, so uh, bear with us. This group was founded really in January. So we will have four more years to re research these issues. And yeah, we would love to stay in contact with uh, some of you, even though we haven't met you uh, face to face yet. Um, and thank you very much for being here. Uh, I give to Paula um, to close the seminar. Thank you, bye-bye. Yeah, thanks a lot, Teresa, and uh, thanks everyone for the insights into your projects. It was really interesting. Also, thanks everyone for being part of this um, session and posting all those interesting and also sometimes critical questions. I think it was really inspiring. Yeah. Okay, I will close this session for now and wish everyone a good rest of the day. Bye. Hey, thank you.